Good day and welcome to a two-part session in which we'll address a truncated history of the treatment of individuals with pronounced mental health disabilities, concerns, divergences, and differences from societal norms. While there are bright points of light throughout that storied history, the archive also contains approaches that are, by today's standards, regrettable. Practices that were sometimes well-intentioned, sometimes not, that besmirch and damage our legacy. That said, our profession, starting in the late 1940s, began to display a growth mindset, learning from our experiences and improving our practice. We also saw the emergence and rise of protections for persons with mental health variations and the requirement of practices that are respectful of the humanity of these individuals. Please know that when we reach the topic of institutionalization, there will be historical images of inhumane and or painful practices that were imposed upon the residents of that setting. If you find images of this type, restraint, punishment, and confinement to be disturbing, please pause the video at that point and move the imagery to a point further along the time bar. Today's presentation will be found in two separate videos. In part one, we will look at how society has treated individuals whose behavior differs significantly from that of most folks within that society. And in part two, we'll take a look at the theoretical models that purport to explain how it is that behavior develops, why it is maintained and what are the preferred methods for changing that behavior pattern for the better, if that is deemed appropriate? If we are to fully understand how we reach this point in time in our profession, it is important that we look to the past so that we better understand why it is that certain um, interventions and certain practices are used at this point, why certain ones are no longer practiced, and where exactly are we going? Perhaps you're familiar with Janus, the two-headed Roman god of transitions. Transitions are difficult for humans. We have to relinquish ways that have worked for us and adopt new ways as circumstances change. Tra Janus looks to the future and the past. He could see the influence of the past on the progress to the future from the present. So, how is all this related to the education of students with mental health and behavior challenges? Right, we must know our past to understand the present and move productively and positively toward the future. But as we look back to the past, what are some of the ancient interventions, strategies, practices, approaches for working with or for individuals who showed mental health and behavioral concerns. Think about some of the things you've heard about that you've read about through ancient times up until maybe the 1940s or the 1950s when a transition to the present began. From your readings of the history of our field and perhaps the study module in our course, what were some of the earlier interventions from thousands of years ago until recently? Recently, let's say the late 1940s, early 1950s. Pause the podcast at this point and bring some of those practices to mind. Let's compare our lists. And perhaps on your list you have 
shaman or spiritualists. They served individuals who were mentally ill, who showed bizarre, unusual, uh, quite variant behavior patterns uh, with folk medicine and healing. There are reports that sometimes the odd behavior patterns were viewed as um, evidence that this person was actually in touch with the spirits and they would become the shaman or the spiritualist for a community. Today, they still exist, and they oftentimes work with Western modern medicine practitioners when an individual ends up in a hospital setting but is more familiar and comfortable with the shaman and spiritualistic practices and the western doctors work together with a shaman in order to provide confidence hope security and comfort to that individual then and now People often attempt to influence this world by personally beseeching support from a spiritual entity or otherworldly influences. Perhaps trefining made it into your listing. The scraping through or drilling through a part of the skull in order to create a hole that would release spirits treat seizures back in the ancient times and trephination is still used in medical practice today although it's reserved for the release of epidermal and subdermal hematoma um, the pooling of blood within the brain cavity and we don't want the pressure pushing against the skull and pushing into the brain to injure or destroy parts of the brain in drilling into the skull and removing a piece of bone the dura matters exposed without damage to the underlying blood vessels or the meninges covering of the brain and the brain itself. Trephination has been used to treat health problems associated with intracranial diseases and epileptic seizures, migraines, and mental disorders, doing so by relieving pressure. As you see in the lower right corner there, some company thought, what a great idea for a game. Sheesh, I need your finding like I need a hole in the head. Bloodletting? Yes, the draining of the blood done so in order to counter the ailment and to cure that ailment. For those of you studied in American history, you may remember that our first president, George Washington, had a sore throat and fever, and they drew blood from him, almost half his blood, and he died from the bloodletting, <laughs> not from the fever and the sore throat. You can get it done at your local barber shop. That was where, you, you know, if you were feeling ill, you'd have some blood drained out. The closest thing we have to that now, I gather, is the uh, when we drop down to the Red Cross blood donation centers or when I, we have blood drawn at the physician's office in order to test it. If you were to be asked, what's the most important organ of the body? Chances are you'd say the brain. However, we've got to consider what part of the body is telling us that. There might be some bias or conflict of interest here. Ah, phrenology, craniology, the study of the shape of the skull, the investigation of the bumps, the ridges, and the indentations. Now, what was this all about? Well, it was believed back in the day that the brain is the organ of the mind, and I suppose it is. The mind is, and they believe that the mind was composed of various parts, each in charge of a distinct characteristic. And 
if that characteristic was well developed or prominent then gee it would have grown and it would have pushed out the skull and you would have a bump there and if it was underdeveloped there would be a depression in that part of the skull I remember being in boot camp and having my head shaved and saying, gee, this is the first time I've had a chance to really uh, see the shape of my skull and uh, to look back into phrenology and see what they would have said about my, about uh, me if they had, uh, had uh, uh, run their hands ac across my skull. But uh, as there's an example there down there at the bottom, that a prominent ridge in the forehead, an area um, uh, deemed to be in charge of benevolence, would indicate that uh, you're a kind and generous person. And indeed you are. But is there a bump in that area? It is at this point that I would like to reiterate the earlier caution that as we approach the topic of institutionalization, and we'll be addressing it in just a moment, that there will be images projected on your screen of practices that were used when society said, uh, your behavior pattern concerns us so that we will send you to a large facility uh, with others of, who also show behavior patterns of concern. And there you will receive some treatment. Sometimes it was well intended, sometimes not. Sometimes they were meant for the benefit of the individual. Other times they were meant to control that individual for protection of that individual or the staff members. If at this point you are concerned about continuing on with, uh, with institutionalization, I would recommend that you pause the recording, that you go down to the timeline along the bottom and move that red bubble along, advancing the program to where you see Janice, once again, that uh, Roman two-headed god of transitions. and pick up the podcast again at that point. Right now, we're going to continue on into the topic of institutionalization. And we see where the word bedlam came from. That bedlam is ensuing. And certainly, when we place individuals with bizarre or very unusual behavior together, in understaffed settings where the staff is poorly trained and society hasn't yet come up with uh, interventions and strategies and approaches that are humane, that are effective. We see some of them there, the various types of restraint. In the um, sort of toward the left side, we'll see an individual up on a platform and spinning a resident around and around and making that resident dizzy. My understanding is that individuals who had flown into a rage or were showing um, a very unusual behavior would be spun around and, gee, that behavior would cease. And it could be that the individual was removed from the setting that was reinforcing that behavior, or it could be that um, uh, that the individual was distracted and did not engage in that behavior because he or she was um, uh, uh, dizzy. Uh, the bathtubs in there, not quite sure whether that is hydrotherapy, which is meant to be soothing and relaxing, very much like we might enjoy a warm bath. There are covers on top of those uh, tubs, which would keep the client inside the tub. So there does appear to be a control mechanism in use here, and it could perhaps be um, a punishment. Uh, I am unsure, and I will leave that to your advanced study to determine that. I gather that you're familiar with the term lobotomy, sometimes referred to as leucotomy. 
We see an original version there, the, uh, the removal of the derma over the skull, um, the drilling of holes, uh, but not stopping as we did with trephination, going into the brain, the prefrontal cortex, and removing certain parts of the brain. This was done especially with individuals who would fly into rages. Um, the result was typically a, a zombie-like uh, sort of outcome of a very calm and uh, and and placid uh, individual after the procedure. We see down in the uh, lower left there a more modernized, so to speak, um, device in which a spinning uh, disc, razor-like disc, would would uh, would move around inside the brain. And take a look at the date there by the red arrow. I mean, this is the 1940s. It's not all that far back. And uh, gosh, if you were in London, you could walk by the showroom and uh, <laughs> see, see it up close. Ah, there is that instrument that we've just witnessed, um, a visual depiction of how it's inserted through the orbital uh, socket and up into the, uh, the cortex and uh, spun around, destroying parts of the brain. It would appear as if that image in the lower right is an actual one. We do see... Um, uh, I'm, I'm surprised by the lack of, of, of sanitary um, um, uh, precautions here, everything from you know gloves to masks and that sort of thing. But uh, yes, inserting that instrument through the orbital socket. I personally wanted to leave those images, but uh, just continuing on with how the lobotomy uh, had advanced, so to speak, in its procedure, that uh, nowadays lobotomies are still performed in very um, uh, exclusive cases. Uh, nowadays, an electrical probe goes up through the orbital socket and into the brain and severs the, uh, the corpus callosum the nerve fiber bundle that uh, exists between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain that allows the uh, the two parts of the brain and the different parts of the brain to communicate with each other. Uh, we know that women, uh, just as a side note, women have a uh, thicker corpus callosum, meaning that their hemispheres are better able to communicate with each other, whereas men uh, with the thinner corpus callosum uh, are uh, more likely to be centered in the left hemisphere, the rational, logical, just the facts, ma'am, uh, get to the point left hemisphere and less able to travel into the right hemisphere, which is more intuitive and artistic and, you know, making this very general and, uh, but uh, a little bit more about uh, the uh, the lobotomy practice. Personally, uh, given all this, uh, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Continuing on with electricity, perhaps somewhere on your list was electroconvulsive therapy, or in the vernacular, shock therapy. If you've had the opportunity to watch uh, Jack Nicholson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, you are familiar with this procedure that his character Murphy uh, received. Uh, however, it, uh, it did not create the behavior that the staff was looking for, and eventually he received a lobotomy. Uh, as for electroconvulsive therapy, it's still done today. You see the image in the lower right corner there from the year 2013. It, 
this procedure is believed to reopen blocked neural pathways and return the person to a previous behavior emotion neurological state. It's used for a number of mental health conditions, but primarily for severe depression, people who have suicidal thoughts and are not responsive to other treatments, oftentimes used too with individuals with schizophrenia. The effects are somewhat temporary though, that we see that when you are going through this procedure, there is a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule that, that is common, but you may need to be retreated a few weeks later or a month later. The practices and the conditions that we were just talking about came to an end in the late 1960s, early 1970s with several um, media exposés and uh, professional organizations requiring changes. And yes, indeed, laws were passed that when institutions, they still exist today, but when they exist, there are certain conditions that must be met, certain ways, uh, positive practices that must be implemented, um, how respect is shown for and to the residents of that facility. So many of these institutions were closed and laws were passed that gave mentally ill individuals decision power over their lives and where they would be treated and how they would be treated. And so yes, a lot of the state mental health, um, uh, mental hospitals were closed down, but society has not provided adequately um, options, um, alternatives. Um, where do these individuals go when they are released from the state hospitals? And unfortunately, many, many of the people with mental health conditions um, are not able to make uh, wise decisions. Um, they're instead making maladaptive uh, decisions regarding uh, their treatment and and their residences. Uh, you see there on the right side that uh, yes indeed uh, we do still have institutional settings and therapeutic settings however the United States is, stands out is exclusive among countries with strong economic systems in that it does not provide universal health care physical for physical or mental health concerns. It is interesting that uh, an interesting point that in September of 2021, former President Trump advocated for placing the mentally ill in institutions. And I don't know if he um, took a viewpoint on whether they should be therapeutic or controlling and punitive. But um, adding to an interesting point is that he has been diagnosed by psychologists in abstentia because the, uh, I believe it's the gold or the gold water act um, uh, uh, professional guidelines that a psychologist should not diagnose someone unless that psychologist, psychiatrist, mental health professional has seen that individual, has been with that individual. But that hasn't stopped many psychologists in the media from uh, including uh, President Trump's cousin as um, saying that he has untreated mental illness and the different uh, diagnostic and statistical manual uh, diagnoses that they identify are narcissism, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, hypomania, sociopathy, sociopathy and, uh, and paranoia. I am not a psychologist. I cannot uh, diagnose these conditions. I offer this again as uh, a point of interest.
let's apply this transition to the present to education. We see here from an article in Exceptional Children, the primary journal of the Council for Exceptional Children, our main special education um, professional group that advocates for the, the rights of, of individuals with disabilities and those who serve them. And back in 1970, Evelyn Dino, and this became known as Dino's Cascade, uh, was talking about there should be a variety of settings for individuals with disabilities. And if we apply this to individuals with mental health and behavior concerns, these are the various settings in which they could be served. We see at the top that an individual with a handicap in quotation marks, now um, a term that has fallen into disfavor because its derivation comes from having one's cap in hand, begging. Okay. Nowadays, the preferred term, but starting to lose some of its favorability, is disability because it translates as lack of ability. We're seeing more and more terms like differently abled and neurodiverse. But in Dino's Cascade, a youngster with a mental health or behavioral concern being in the regular classroom without any supports. That would be the, uh, the wonderful outcome that we would like to see as a final goal. As we look at the level two, we see a class attendance plus some services added in. So this could be um, the various models of co-teaching that are implemented, push-in programs where professionals come into the classroom as opposed to pulling the youngster out of the classroom for services, which we see in level three. Uh, perhaps a, a resource room where the youngster goes to learn um, social skills or um, to work on some academic area. We're seeing less and less of level three and more of level two. A great deal of my experience was in a full-time special class. These youngsters were not yet ready to succeed in the general ed classroom, even with a special ed teacher working with a gen ed teacher. And uh, so, uh, yes, we do have placements typically, oh, eight to 12 youngsters, uh, typically externalizing behaviors, opposition, defiance, aggression, high levels of activity uh, versus internalized behavior because youngsters who are keeping their emotions contained and within themselves and not acting it out behaviorally well, they're not disturbing the classroom, and so they are being under-identified and not receiving services that they need. Special stations would probably refer to special schools. There are schools just for individuals with a certain um, uh, uh, for certain differences and special needs. Homebound, if uh, you know, nowadays, mostly for youngsters who are recovering from surgery or have a long-term uh, severe ailment, the educator will go to the home. Bellevue Hospital has a level six setting where the youngsters are in there for mental health concerns, but there's also an educational program attached to that versus level seven, which would I, I suspect be primarily, you know, we just don't see much of that anymore because all individuals can learn something. Education no longer meaning just academics, but advancement in one's abilities and skills. We end this session as we began with Janice. We have looked to the past. We have seen practices and procedures and policies that reflected models for 
treating individuals with mental health and behavior variations. Many of them and the models that they reflect are no longer professionally acceptable. Some are now illegal. And we are in the present. We have moved forward from the past. But what's the future look like? Well, we we'll see a lot. Um, we're being influenced right now by data-based research studies that are quickly emerging. And we're finding out more and more what works and what doesn't, while still considering the humanity of the individual. Not just that it works, but at that it works in a way that respects the character of the person. Additionally, we're getting a great deal of medical and scientific research in the, in the literature now, and it's influencing our practice, the neurological brain scans, so that we better understand conditions and we understand what is happening as we intervene. Yes, as we look to the future horizon, we see a sun rising. And that future looks so bright, we have to wear sunglasses. Yes, I am the eternal optimist. And as I near the end of my career, I am so pleased that you folks are taking over for us. You are well informed, you are skilled, and you care about kids. Please join me for in the second video as we'll look at the new models for working with individuals who have mental health and behavior concerns and how we can best serve them.